Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my family room. In this video, I'm going to show you how I made and installed these ash hardwood floors. Now, our story begins out in the woods, but unfortunately, when I cut down these trees, that was before I was actually making videos, so I don't have any video footage of me cutting down the trees, but I do remember where all the stumps were. So let's head out to the woods, take a walk, and see if we can find where these trees used to be. So we're taking a little walk in the woods, and I'm trying to find where these trees were. We cut these in the winter, so the landscape was very different than it is now in the late summer. So you can kind of see the first stump right there. I'm gonna walk around and take a look at it. But that tree was totally uprooted and was laying right here. All the way straight through here. There it is. Totally uprooted stump. See I cut part of this root off just to see what it would look like. So here is the other stump, or one of the other stumps. This tree was uh, straight up, but it was actually snapped off and part was leaning over into the canopy over there. And you can actually see the brush from this tree is right there. And a little bit over here too. These branches here are all from the same tree. Here's a shot of that tree after I got it on the ground. And this is the first tree I was talking about being pulled out of the woods. In the spring, we pulled another ash tree out of the woods. The log that is second from the right produced my favorite floorboards. Here's one of the bigger sections of that tree being transported across the field. We milled the logs into boards for this project on two different occasions. If you've been following my videos for a while, you might recall a video I did in January of 2015 about my friend Jim's homemade hydraulic powered swing blade sawmill. In that video we cut up a few of these ash logs and the boards we produced all went into this project. The other occasion might look familiar also. This was from my video sawmill day that I did in March of 2015. Towards the end of the day we grabbed a few of the extra ash logs that had been sitting around and milled them for my flooring. The log on the mill now is the one that produced my favorite floorboards. You can see how the large limb in the middle and the crotch at the end produced the areas of extreme figure in the boards. We actually ended up cutting these logs well past dark. As the boards were cut, I loaded them in the back of my truck, and the next day I stacked them to dry in my basement. And while the wood is drying, let's start on the room prep. Here are a couple of before shots of the room. We wanted to remove the wall paneling, pull up the carpet, and possibly replace the trim. We started by removing the wall paneling, taping and mudding all the drywall seams, and painting the walls. A little while later, we were ready to tackle the floors. I got a nice surprise when I rolled back the carpet. Whoever installed the carpet covered up some pretty bad pet stains that had soaked into the particle board underlayment. I cut away the worst sections to buy me some time before having to pull up the rest of the particle board. <laughs> that was good. Look how strong you were. Oh yeah. With all that removed, I could evaluate the flatness of the subfloor. Carpet will mask a lot of flatness deviations, but wood floors, not so much. The subfloor looked a little off, so I brought in a straight edge, and oh boy. <laughs> the hump you see is where the I-beam that supports the floor joist is. And looking at these joists as they sit on the I-beam, I could see the top of the joists were not flush at the top of the I-beam. This was the case for just about every joist in the floor. So using a bottle jack, I jacked up each joist until it was level with the top of the beam and placed a shim between the bottom of the joist and the I-beam. This solved the dip on the right side, but the left side would still have to be shimmed. To figure out the size of the shim I needed, I laid my straight edge over the joist, measuring the rise and then measuring the run, in other words, the distance from the wall to the point where the straight edge starts to contact the floor. 
I could then lay that out on a piece of 2x and cut the shim with my track saw. Most of these ended up being about 1 inch over 52 inches. I could then lay down some 3 quarter inch tongue groove OSB over the entire floor. I needed to use an underlayment here so the finished floor height of this room would be in line with the kitchen floor. I also added some dominoes to the ends of the OSB that didn't have a tongue and groove joint. After I had most of the room prep done, I moved the pile of lumber into the room to finish drying and to make some room in the basement for drying other stuff. I figured the fastest and easiest way to get the boards down into the shop would be out the window. We made two piles, one for the boards that were ready to be processed, they had a clean edge and weren't much wider than the final width, and a second pile with the boards that needed some more work first. These were the wider boards that would need to be ripped down first, and the ones that had two live edges. The first step in the milling was to run an edge of each board over the jointer so it had a nice straight edge to work off of. For ripping all these boards, I moved the bandsaw out into the driveway so we didn't have to try and maneuver these boards through my shop. Now I'll go through and rip all the boards down to a rough width of 6 inches. As I was ripping, I set any sizable offcuts aside. I made narrower strips out of these that I could mix into the floor. Now I can start planing all these boards down. I planed all the boards to a final thickness of 3 quarters of an inch, and on the last pass I chose the show face of the board and made a mark to indicate the bottom of the board. It took about 7 hours to plane all these boards, and it was extremely boring. <laughs> After all the planing, I put the boards back into the house and called it a day. The next day I worked on this project, I started by squaring up one edge at the jointer. Dima was kind enough to help me with the milling for a few hours on this really hot day. Next we took all the boards and ripped them down to their final width. The main floor boards were ripped to a final width of 5 and 3 quarters of an inch, and I also managed to make some narrow ones that were 5 and a half, 4 inch, and 3 inches wide out of those offcuts that I saved. Now with all the floorboards milled into blanks, we can start the tongue and groove. I used the table saw with a dado blade to cut both the tongue and the groove. To keep the groove centered, we turned the boards end for end and ran them through a second time. I made this groove a quarter inch wide and 5 sixteenths of an inch deep. Now for the top half of the tongue. I have the blade set to remove a quarter inch of material here and I'm running the boards vertically which should give me a more consistent thickness tongue due to the feather boards than if I ran the boards flat on the table. This is because most of the boards are not flat, they have some bow and the feather boards flatten them out. Next we ran the bottom of the tongue. For this cut I raised the blade a bit so when the tongue fits into the groove only the top section contacts the top of the mating groove. And now the last step in the milling process, creating the relief cuts on the bottom. To get started with the install, I rolled out some rosin paper over the floor. This will help me to keep the floor clean since it's easy to sweep up debris and make the boards slide together a bit easier. You could also use felt paper or something like Aquabar here. For the first row, I started with a narrow width floorboard. I used my chop saw to trim the ends of the boards and cut them to length. I set this up so I was always cutting with the groove towards the fence. That way when the ends of the boards butt together, they'll line up perfectly since any error in the squareness of the cut will be cancelled out. To get the boards straight, I measured out from the wall at both ends and snapped the chalk line. 
When installing the first row, I placed the boards on that line, so if the wall was doing anything goofy, the flooring would still be straight. I also left an expansion gap of about a half inch between the boards and the wall, and this first row gets face nailed down. I didn't feel like removing the door jams to trim them down so the floor would run underneath them, so I used a flush trim saw on top of a piece of flooring to cut them to length. And this is what a lot of the install was like. I'd have my boards selected and cut, and I would work the tongue until it fits into the groove properly. Sometimes I got lucky and didn't have to do any adjusting. Here's an example of something I had to fix occasionally. When we were running the tongues, sometimes the board would lift up a bit, leaving a little bit of material. It wasn't really a problem if I noticed it, I would just run the board through the table saw again. But the track saw made fixing the ones I missed really easily. One of the things I didn't do when installing the OSB was screw it all down. I figured for sanity reasons I could just finish screwing them down as I went. I screwed them into the joists and this made a noticeable difference in the rigidness of the floor and took out any squeaks from the loose nails in the subfloor. As I worked my way along, I would cut and lay out a few rows of flooring. To stagger the seams, I used an offcut along the far wall so I wouldn't have any short boards as you walked into the room. And as I was laying these out, I was really trying to maximize the yield of my boards and leave each board as long as possible so I had as few seams as possible in the finished floor. I also added dominoes to the ends of the boards to help keep them aligned. Something worth mentioning is this install took me about a month. This was a very tedious process, so I would come into the room to work on it from time to time for maybe an hour or so until I just got bored of it. That kept it somewhat fun. <laughs> Here's my fastening strategy. I first use a flooring nailer to nail the flooring down. These nailers are great because as you strike them to drive the nail, the force closes up any gap between the board you're nailing and the previous board. Now since OSB doesn't have the best nail holding power, and since the flooring nailer doesn't shoot nails long enough to go through the OSB, and into the subfloor, I came back with my 15 gauge finish nailer and nailed through the tongue. These nails were long enough to go all the way through into the subfloor. Now on to the last few rows. This is where it starts to get interesting. As I got closer to the wall, it became more difficult to strike the nailer. This was the last row I could use the flooring nailer on. For the rest of the rows, I got creative with wedges to force the boards together as I nailed them with the finish nailer. When I got even closer to the wall, I used a pair of opposing wedges to force the boards together. It was at this point that I had to remove the heater because it was in the way. This also revealed the last bit of wall paneling that I had to remove. And now for the last row. I ripped these to width, dropped them in, and used my pry bar to press them against the previous board. Once I got the whole row fit, I came back with a nailer and nailed them down as I was prying them together. So I'm getting started filling all of the voids with epoxy and some tint. And I got most of the floor done, about three quarters of the way. Lots of little defects to fill. They're everywhere. The last little bit of the install was to add some of these decorative bow ties to some of the cracked boards that I intentionally left. I installed four of these and made them all different sizes. I cut these out of an African blackwood turning blank. Next, I went over all the seams with some wood filler to fill any gaps between the boards, and then I could start sanding the floor. I rented this large pad sander for this. Since my boards were pretty level and clean as is, I didn't have much material to remove to smooth everything out. This pad sander is pretty gentle, so I didn't have to worry about the sander digging in like a drum sander would or swirl marks from an orbital sander. Also, since it randomly oscillates, you don't necessarily have to sand with the grain. I started with 60 grit and then moved to 80 grit. I later went over the whole floor with my random orbit sander using 120 grit. Using my random orbit sander for the final grit allowed me to get close to the floor so I could see any defects or issues that I might have missed with the large sander. The one issue with this large sander was the dust collection wasn't very great. 
it would leave a layer of dust on the floor, which killed its sanding efficiency. I took care of that layer of dust with a leaf blower. Before getting started with the finish, I went over the entire floor with a rag dampened with mineral spirits to clean up any remaining dust and debris. To contain the fumes, I hung a sheet of plastic in the doorway to the room, taping all the way around it with duct tape. The finish I chose to use is a two-coat flooring finish system from Glitza. This type of finish is known as a Swedish finish or an acid cure finish. It is an extremely durable finish, but the downside is it has some really crazy fumes. This doorway is the only place where air from this room and the rest of the house can freely mix since this room is not on the HVAC system. This sheet of plastic did a really great job of containing the fumes. To apply the finish, I chose to use a roller as my applicator and I used some tape to make sure there wasn't any loose material on the roller. The first coat of this finish system is a seal coat. This product has a hardener that gets mixed into it to activate it. I started applying the sealer by first cutting the edges with a brush and then applying the finish to the field with the roller. Just like any other project, finishing is always an awesome experience because it really just brings the wood to life. I can really get to see what this is going to look like and I was so happy. <laughs> So I went over the entire floor, it took me about 15 minutes or so to cover the entire floor with the finish, and it was incredible. <laughs> so I worked my way back to the door, and I had just enough finish to cover the entire floor. I shut the door and allowed it to dry for a few hours and I came back and opened the windows and door to allow the fumes to escape. A few days later I was ready to apply the top coat. I gave the floor a light sanding and wiped up the dust with lacquer thinner and then I was ready for the top coat. I applied this in the same way I did the sealer. I cut in with a brush and used a roller to cover the field working back to the door. Again, I had the windows and door closed to keep the dust out until the finish had dried for a few hours. Now I thought I'd show some of my favorite uh, places on the floor, so that's cool. I like that. And there's one of the bow ties right there with a the crack. So this is awesome. I like this one a lot. Can I get that? There we go. That's cool. I like that a lot. Everything from this one log that had all this crotch figure and this compression figure is just amazing. I have that kind of scattered throughout the floor. Here's the double butterflies. There's another one from that log. That's another one of my favorites. And then the last butterfly is right there. And some more crotch figure here. So I'm really, really happy with the way this turned out. It's just incredible looking. So here we are a few months after I finished the floors and they look incredible. I absolutely love the way they turned out and I'm just so happy with them. I especially love, of course, my favorite floorboards. I have them mixed into the floor and I put them in uh, pretty strategic spots that I knew wouldn't be covered up by furniture. So I got some here and over there and all over the place. <laughs> Now one thing I didn't mention in the video itself is I actually ran the flooring in two batches just to kind of keep my sanity and to really get a little bit more of a closer approximation of how much material I would actually need. So I made the first batch which was 300 square feet and the second batch was about 100 square feet and I ended up with about 30 or so square feet left over and this room itself is about um, 325 square feet or so. Now a big thank you to my wife for all of her help making the flooring and installing it. She was extremely helpful. And to this guy too, because you were in there. <laughs> you were in there helping too. <laughs>
And of course, a giant thank you to Dima as well for all the times he stopped by to give me a hand making the flooring and installing it. Thanks again, Dima. I'll have a link to his channel in the description and up in the cards as well. Now, the really cool thing about this project is, and I didn't realize it as I was doing it, is it encompasses so much of my videos and my prior work that as I was going through making the video, it's just like video after video after video I could reference. So if you haven't seen some of those and you're interested in those, take a look at some of those related videos. I'm sure you'll enjoy those as well. So that's about it for this one. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments about anything I showed in the video with the install, the milling or the trees or whatever, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.